These feet are insane. It's tapered towards the knee side like that. Control L and boom. I know exactly where they put all their seams. Nothing. Oh, it's joined to the thing. Rogue 3D modelers from the leading anime slash gacha games leaked all of their company's secrets. Okay, not really, but what's crazier is that these companies willingly do it themselves. They release their models for free to the public. They give anyone, including you, the ability to download their 3D models and open them up in 3D editing software to take a look at all of the goods. But why would they do this? Why would they risk giving out their trade secrets? Well, there's a small catch. Just like any fine piece of art, anyone can look at it and inspect it all they want, but that doesn't necessarily mean they can figure out the methods used to get there. But that's where hobby 3D modelers come in and reverse engineer the methods based on what they can see. And that's what we've been doing on this series so that we can all be a step closer to creating similar 3D models from our own basements. Now I've already casually made some 3D models but I think it's time to take it one step higher and make one using everything I've learned so far from reverse engineering the pros. And while doing that, let me share those things with you. One of the first things to consider is what the model is actually going to be used for, specifically what devices is it going to be on because that's going to give you a ballpark of the total polygons that will be used in your model. For example, Zenless Zone Zero is meant to be smooth on mobile and so everything is hyper optimized with total vertices being around 25,000 to 35,000 per model. Now their work is really good to look at if you want to have things looking great while still being as efficient as possible. Compare this to Wuthering Ways where the target audience is mainly PC players with some mobile play as well and on average their models can double that of Zenless Zone Zeros in terms of vertice count depending on how complex the character design is. Now when we're actually modeling we're not gonna be like counting literally every vertex and trying to hit the exact number like a word count on an essay but what we can look at is where they save on vertices and where they choose to add more density. So in general Zenless Zone zeros density is lower anything that doesn't bend like it's away from a joint and it doesn't have any clothing or muscle detail you can save on quite a few loops like for example the forearm right nothing's bending there there's nothing going on there it's just pretty much a cylinder same with in between the finger joints usually you can save on some on the thigh and the calf as well and you'll notice that even on areas that would bend a lot for example the shoulder slash armpit area the knees the elbows things like the finger joints as well and you'll notice they'll save a lot of loop cuts on these where usually you would add more loop cuts but instead what they do instead of adding more loops they tailored the geometry to the elbow and knee structures themselves so that looks and bends more naturally in those areas and I'm sure they also do something on the rigging side as well to compensate for that. Compare this to Wuthering Ways where this, this is what they do. They just add a bunch of loop cuts to the armpit slash shoulder area. Same thing for the knees. They don't bother with the mesh structure of the knee itself. They just add the knee details to the texture and they add a bunch of loop cuts so that it helps with the bends. Same thing with their joints as well. And you'll notice that with their joints, they flare it out on one side like this. And that does help with the effect that they're trying to achieve. So you can kind of see like on the knee, right? Instead of this being like a straight rectangle in terms of the lines, it's tapered towards the knee side like that. So at the top it's going down, from the bottom it's going up. So what that does is it's more dense toward this end. So when it bends, the vertices can stretch. And when this part bends in, they can pinch. That might be a little confusing, but if you try it with like a rig, you'll be able to see the difference. I hope you're noticing though that I'm not telling you that either of these models is better than the other or that one is right and one is wrong. It's all about use case and what your goals are with your specific model because there's advantages and disadvantages to every single design choice you make, every single method you choose to use. I'm just showing you the different options and in the end it's up to you to decide which one is better for your specific scenario. Zenless Zone Zero also usually saves a lot on their hairstyles, which are usually simpler. They don't have as many strands as even their own other titles. And that's mainly specific to their art style where they don't need as much small strands. They just have their hair usually in big clumps like this. And they simplify the structure wherever they can. And they'll still do neat things like these braids just more efficiently. 
compare this of course to Wuthering Waves where they do decide to go in and model pretty much every single strand. This is what makes their 3D art very close to their 2D art because they take a lot of time and care into modeling literally every single strand in detail as seen on the 2D as well. And here from the back we can see this is a very big hairstyle and complex as well. But perhaps in the next episode, we'll break this down on how you can create a similar hairstyle with the same complexity, but basically we'll just break it down so it's not as intimidating. It's made up of mainly big strands, and then you add these medium size and small size strands in after. And you also take advantage of symmetry and mirroring. A lot of this hairstyle is just duplicated to the other side, like for example, here, here, here. They vary the sizes on each side so that it breaks up the symmetry a little and it doesn't make it look too unnatural. And the medium or small strands that they add are not symmetrical. So that also breaks it up here, here. Even just adding a few asymmetrical strands helps a lot with creating that illusion. So here's our work in progress. As you can see, we've got the big strands done. Now we just have to add the details and we have to asymmetrize it just a little bit. And don't worry, I'll walk you through that process when we get there. The amazing thing too about their hairstyles is as complex as they are, it's all connected. It's not like a bunch of different hair strands that we get from some of the hair methods that we typically see when making our own models. They have a very structured way of creating their hair so that it all comes back together neatly into one mesh. And we're also trying to replicate that with our own model. If you see here, you get a little insight on how I'm trying to reverse engineer that method. Basically, I created a half sphere or a quarter sphere. And then I chopped off the ends and extruded out of those ends to create the long flowing hair downwards. And you can see in the middle of this process, right, I separated them just because now it's easier to clone the strands and also um, sculpt them. But when everything is all said and done, what you'll notice is that we can easily join it back together because we got one, two, three, four, and that will join up perfectly with this one, two, three, four. And then we, ju we just join it all back down at the end. And of course, every time we create an offshoot strand, we connect it back to the main mesh, and that is also very easy to do. I'm gonna go over all this once I fully complete this hairstyle and put it into a separate video for you to see all the steps to this. The next important thing to consider is our modeling method for the main parts of the character, such as the body and face. The methods I use to replicate their 3D models don't use any sculpting. Everything is poly modeled. Here on the right is a face I referenced from Punishing Grey Raven, and on the left is the the face that I made. And here's an overview of how that went. First I modeled the face making sure I use a subdivision surface modifier of 1. This is necessary to get that smooth curvature on the face. Again, this is an overview, but I have full tutorials on how to poly model faces, which I'll link down below. For now, the important thing here is take note of where the purple lines are. These are the edges where I've increased the crease value using Shift E and drag to the right to increase it all the way to one. And these are just the edges where I'm telling Blender, okay, these are where the sharp lines should be. Do not use subdivision curvature for these areas because if I don't have them on those areas, this is what happens. And the main goal on this first step was to have as few lines as possible, just enough to capture the details of an anime face. So we will need a couple for the lips, right? Some for the nose, a certain number for the eye sockets, and this is the lowest that I got it down to. You might be wondering why this is important. It's because after we apply the subdivision, it's gonna turn into a lot of faces. And the more unnecessary faces and edges we have, the harder it will be to work with. And if you want, you can take a look at how many vertices, for example, this one, this eye loop has eight. And you can also take note of, okay, how many edges are there in between the eye and the nose, things like that. So here we got two edges. And that's just to capture the correct curve of the nose. There's an edge here between the nose and the lip. You gotta capture that crease as well. So again, just enough edges, just enough geometry to capture the details that we need. The next step would be to apply those subdivisions. So we apply the mirror and the subdivision modifiers. And we'll get something like this. 
Now you'll notice we have a problem because this was our reference, right? This is the face that we're trying to replicate, trying to reverse engineer. But now we have a face mesh that is more dense and that's mostly okay. But in this case, we're trying to closely replicate the Pro 3D model and have a solution in case we need to cut down on some vertices. So the next step would be to alt left click these uh, extra edges and try to get the edge count down to more similar to our reference. So we delete and then we dissolve the edges and then we select the surrounding edges, double tap G and slide them into place until we get our desired density. So there are a few uh, edges that you can freely dissolve. We can do some of these that go around as well. And it's just a matter of spacing those out. If you want, you could also do the same thing and count the number of edges like between the eye and the nose, between the nose and the mouth, and that will give you something more closely accurate to your source material. Some places you have to be careful because if you dissolve in the wrong places, you will get um, N-gons like this, so more than four-sided faces. But you can also work around those as well. Maybe we add some in some places like the lip as well. That nicely loop cuts all the way around. Then you can see after a few dissolves, it's more closely resembling our original reference. Then we can move on to our next step, which is we do our final tweaks. We still need to mold the face shape into exactly the way we want. Some of the tweaks we had were not available until we applied subdivision surface modifier. For example, look at the lips, right? Uh, in the original, we have this nice curve, but we can't achieve that when we had the limited geometry because we only had this bend. But now that we apply the subdiv, we have this to work with, right? And now we can push that out. Just give you a little preview. And after that, you would just simply add the rest of the face details. I will make new videos on that as well, or if you want, you can settle for some of my older tutorials. Again, link in the description. And for those wondering why the top half of the head is cut off for a reference, that's a normal practice in many of these games, simply because that part is never seen by the hair, so they also cut down on vertices by deleting that part. That's a later step down in the process, and I don't recommend you do that yet, because having the actual head there will give you a nice reference of where to put the hair and whatnot. So don't decapitate your model just yet. Modeling the body also follows a similar process. First, I model the base of the body as simply as I can. It's kind of how it went. Again, this is gonna be a series, so don't worry, we're gonna revisit every part. For those that want every single step in detail, and every button to press will have that. Same concept with the face. We only use as much lines needed to get the details that we want, such as like on the elbows, on the butt area, the knees, and we're relying on subdivision surface modifier to get that smooth curvature. And then similar to the face, we would continue to work on it after we apply the subdivision surface. Actually, this turned out really nicely. I don't think I tweaked a lot even. When I got to this point, as I mentioned before, the loops were planned out. So for example, on the armpit shoulder area, we got this nice clean division here where we can create more loop cuts if we want to ensure that area folds properly. Now you can always re-mirror it when you're making your changes, make sure life easy. And usually I just add extra loops to the joints as needed. If you're going to add extra details, such as how ZZZ has that extra um, structure for their knees and elbows, as well as maybe the um, belly button, clavicle, shoulder blades. If you want those in the mesh itself, I would suggest now is when you add those in rather than before you apply the subdivision surface modifier. It's just gonna be a lot more clean that way. Now, as for the feet and hands, again, we do have tutorials on those as well. I think Wuthering Ways has updated their feet method. I'm not sure, I could be imagining things, but their feet look so much more detailed now, and it, it just hits different, you know? Like, why is it so detailed? And we're gonna try to see how we can replicate this. Feet and hands, I usually don't use subdivision surface while modeling them. You just model them straight up without any subdiv. But we will see. Common thing to reverse engineer these hands and feet. First thing you can always check, turn on statistics in your viewport overlays and just select a loop around a whole toe or finger. Make sure it goes around the whole thing. So we got 13 vertices around the toe. And I think it's the same for the finger. Yeah, that's 13 as well. So we'll just keep that in mind when we're making our fingers. Because ironically, once you know that number, it pretty much like how it connects to the palm, it's easy to figure out 
how to do the fingernail area is easy to figure out as well. Kind of see how they Frankenstein or transition their leg into their foot. When I did tries to quads, it kind of made it weird, but I can see like, okay, this part, right? This part might be where they joined it. Yeah, because this is where it becomes, yeah, that's probably where it connected. And you could tell because these straights right here, and then you got the triangle to merge down into an area that has a different amount of, anyways. Yeah, that would, that would make sense. That's not really that important anyways. Why am I, why am I yapping about this? Next thing to think about is what's our texturing solution? Because these guys don't just two-tone their, their skin, for example. This thing looks full on painted and they even got the painted details for the knees as well. They got these 3D artists doing 2D painting on their models too. Like look at that. Or maybe it's not one guy, who knows. I think the solution here would be to just use a gradient material and have this baked in, right? So we can have the base of it, have the base gradient over the body. And then after we bake it, we can take that baked texture and then texture in the details such as the back of the knee, the kneecaps, everything. Now I'm looking at this and you might be wondering, oh, they don't reveal where their seams are. Like, cause usually a seam would look like this, right? It's a red line and you can tell that's where the seam is. We don't see them on this model that we downloaded, but have no fear for this is the tech. I select one vertice on the foot, I press Control L, and boom, I know exactly where they put all their seams. So they put a seam here, they put a seam to separate the sole of the foot from the mid of the foot, and that makes sense because that would make it easy to do these bottom like airbrushing on the soles here because that is somewhat annoying when like for example if it's in if the seam is in a weird spot you're trying to paint an area but it'll cut off because the area you're painting is in between two different seams but this seems like a logical place to put that and of course they got their toenails all seamed and separated too that is very clean that's very clean and that's pretty much a trick you can do with the entirety of the body if you want to know where their seams are of the hair they cut it off about halfway so they separate the front from the back and all these details that they add we'll take note of it and we'll add it to our checklist on how we're going to do it for our model look at this too how um certain parts of the outfit when they're like really close to the skin they just paint it onto the skin itself and when you see it up close the texture resolutions are a bit of a mismatch but you'll never see that up close in game so they really know when they can get away with these things is what I am learning. Goodness gracious, man. Y'all got something for me here, Coral Games, or what? Nothing? Oh, it's joined to the thing, bro. They joined it to the thing. One thing our model definitely has to include is an S tier outfit. Like these guys spend a lot of time on their outfits. The embellishments like this thing. And this is such a detailed character. We need to try to get this level of detail on our model. That's our goal for this one. That's a really nice effect how they have like this galaxy kind of overlay on her little flowy, flowy thingy. And I can see from the texture some transparent on top of a base layer. Okay, we might do something like that then. But I think that's gonna do it for today, guys. This was, again, meant to be more of an overview of how we're gonna model our next character to utilize all of these secret techniques and methods that the pros, they're just putting out there for free. And I'll hope to catch you in the next one. Have a good night.